Check one, two. Check one, two. Is this thing on? Yeah, it is. All right. We're good. We're good. We're good. Uh, so uh, super happy to be starting to do these interviews again. I worked out it was basically a year since I'd done them and I am going to try and do uh, one a month because uh, as I've said before, right, you know, I've got a, a massive personal interest in, in speaking to all these people from from back in the day, um, whether they're still around now or, or whether they're not. Uh, a lot of the people that I speak to have had a huge impact in the scene, whether behind the scenes or, or up front or on stage, uh, as is the case with my guest for tonight. Uh, and as we know, none of this stuff was documented and some books are coming out. But, you know, this is a chance to kind of hear the stories and get a little bit deep and find out you know just what went on you know behind the scenes and what was going on from from that perception there are so many different points of perceptions from that era uh so it's nice to hear uh, all of them that we can mix all together so uh this guest i'm super proud we've uh, actually been friends i was trying to work this out it's nearly 20 years uh, crazily enough um she started in the scene in 1992 as the first female MC for Hardcore Jungle Drum and Bass. And 30 years later, she's never been busier. She's still going. And I know a lot of you guys uh, know her specifically for uh, being G Real, uh, rest in peace, uh, uh, MC. Uh, and they did some phenomenal sets and did some amazing stuff, you know, throughout the country. Uh, but there's so much more. Uh, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce the guest for tonight, MC Chickaboo. Hey! <laughs> we might be invaded by a squirrel at some point. Yeah. He's just over there. So you're going to hear like some crunching noises. He might just leap on me. So just to give you a heads up, we might be joined by a squirrel. This could get very interesting because my cat is probably going to scratch on the door. So if my cat comes in and sees a squirrel, this this <laughs> hell could break loose, basically. <laughs> Just claws everywhere. We'll see how that one goes. Um, yeah. We'll talk about that squirrel in a little bit. But listen, thank you very much for taking the time to come and speak to me today. I know we've tried to organise organize this quite a few times. Uh, and so we're here and we're talking. And I'm very, very, very pleased to have you uh, on the show. So, uh, listen, let, let's take it way, way back. Let's take it back to that kind of first moment where you... Uh, as a human being connected to music, when was it that you connected to music and thought that something's going on there? Where, do you remember that moment? I do, actually. Um, my mum called me up um, a couple of weeks ago and was playing this song in the background and was asking me if I remembered it. And it's the Smurfs. And it was my very first record. And we brought it from... Um, like a really cool record shop that was in Birmingham Market that used to play like reggae and stuff, you know, that kind of like record shop that blasts the yeah, music yeah, out. Yeah, and so we'd yeah. walk past and I was a little girl and I would dance and stuff being a kid. And um, I demanded that they played the Smurfs on on this sound system. And he played it from beginning to end and I stood there and danced around to it. Four years <laughs> old apparently at this point. So that was my very first record and my first sort of time of realizing that you can be into sounds and music and songs but you could also go somewhere and purchase this piece of vinyl and go home and put it on the record deck and I think that was the start of me um, you know realizing that you could physically touch sounds I'd never had that experience before. And I remember, you know, the crackle of the intro scratches on the vinyl. And I'll never yeah. forget hearing that sound. And then the sort of like whoosh when all the music comes through. And of course, then little record players were just like a single speaker. I mean, pretty yeah, much how it yeah. is now, right? Yeah. We didn't have yeah, stereo, yeah. it's just like a mono. But I remember hearing that crackle and then the sort of the fullness of how loud the music and the sounds were. <clears throat> Excuse me. I do remember that. And that, I think, kick-started my um, obsession with music and stuff. And then I remember seeing Grandmaster Flash on TV and he was grabbing the record and moving it back and forward and making these really cool sounds and stuff. And that's when I fell in love with DJs. Because it's funny, isn't it, you know, to think of music as a tangible thing now, 
like the the I wouldn't even say kids, right? Even kind of 25, 30 year olds, you know, are mostly remembering music as downloads or whatever. So, you know, it's it adds that extra specialness to it, right? For something that you can physically hold and yeah. and, and and touch. Uh, and it's interesting that you mentioned Grandmaster Flash, you know, I I remember watching like the DMCs, like the early DMCs, like 88, 89 and seeing like Chad Jackson, those guys and just like, you know, I was vague, uh, you know, like you, I had like just this like little record player that my mum and dad did. So I was aware of, you know, that music was on, on, on vinyl, but then seeing guys do this, it was like, it just blows your mind. It's like, well, yeah. it's, what know, are it's, they doing? Just, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, that they were ruining the record. <laughs> Essentially, that's what you're doing. They were ruining the record, but the sound of it. And what I loved as well was the fact that my parents didn't like it. Like, because yeah. they were into like rare groove and soul and reggae. And that's what I was brought up on. So then yeah. to grab my parents' pride and joy, Bob Marley, catch a fire, a picture version. And I'm grabbing it, doing this. <laughs> just ruining the whole like the whole of everything but there was oh. nothing like it at that time yeah. and it felt like it was it was made for me where the music I was brought up on was made for my parents where this new you know hip-hop thing with kids spinning on their backs and doing these weird sort of movements and dressing in tracksuits and you know we just never saw and being from like you know a council estate 10 miles out of Birmingham never seen nothing like it before yeah. or heard anything like it like these people were talking over music they were talking over me like what is that but the way they were doing it like the delivery and stuff you know i'll just never forget seeing break dancing and and that's so yeah. that was the start of me realizing that music was for me as well that i didn't yeah. just have to like what my parents liked well, it's the, it's 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 the generational movement, right? And it's yeah. also wrapped up in a whole culture movement, like you say, the way people dress, the way people dance, the way they performed, the music that kind of came with it as well. Spray well, we, spray cams, people oh, using spray, spray cams, yeah, like you'd see kids spraying. I was like, what are they doing? What is this? And so the whole movement sort of triggered a lot of things within me that I really yeah. liked, but I didn't know I liked it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like this and kind of deep, primal sort of desire that was being satisfied that I didn't even yeah. know that I had it. Wow. So you, you really had like quite quite a connection to this this music, obviously. Yes. So what was the, while this was kind of going on, obviously the music comes first, right? You're hearing these new sounds. At what point did you kind of feel like, you know, I want to get involved in this, obviously, you know, as an MC. Was there someone that inspired you to start doing it? Were you writing lyrics down for ages? How did that kind of start, that seed start getting sown for you? I started out as a DJ first. Started like buying vinyl, collecting it. And then um, I joined a little sound system playing reggae and soul and rare grooves and stuff. And I had friends that were into this really weird sort of acid house, hardcore music and stuff. And they asked me if um, I would get some of this music to play. So when they came to the sound system parties and then before they were going to the raves, they would come to the pub where we were playing and things. And so they asked me if I would play a few hardcore tunes. Now, I didn't like it. I didn't, it didn't make sense to me, all the bleeps and the weird sort of sped up hip hop beats. And the, I didn't, didn't like it. Um, and so I started playing, I started playing it for my friends and stuff like that. And I'd literally just the same way that I would introduce tunes for the reggae side of it and stuff and just chat or toast or just say little things. Um, I just was messing around doing it over the hardcore tunes. Just what about, but about, but about, but about, but about, but about, but just that. And my mates went mad and was like, oh my God, if you did that in a rave, like it would be brilliant. There's no female MCs, there's no girls, really. There's DJ rap. And that was it. And, um, and so, yeah, I just messed around once over the hardcore tunes and, uh, yeah. They just went mad, but yeah, I started DJing in like my youth club, and how, how like old that. were you at this stage? I was about fourteen or fifteen. Okay. So it was um, tunes like Lamborghini, 
yeah. and um, suck, it, suck It Deep. That was a big anthem. Mr. Kirk's Nightmare. All those kind of tunes, you know. Yeah. SL2, yeah. their early stuff, you know, yeah. before they had that pop hit. I can't remember what they did before, but there's a big tune. Um, that Mickey Finn tune, One uh, Family. Uh, 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 yeah, Urban Shakedown, Some Justice. That's yeah. it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there was all that kind of, when I first started, it was all that kind of hands in the air and happy days and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, so I basically how... just started out just messing around, really, and just feeling a vibe. And here you are 30 years later. <laughs> here I am 30 years later. And I didn't like record shops and all of that whole process of trying to like get the good tunes and you could never get them unless you knew the people. And I didn't build up those relationships because I didn't like, record shopping I still don't really you know and um I've figured out that I could go to the same parties and stuff without having to buy all the records and drag them around because like them record boxes were heavy yeah yeah back and, in the and day, when you start right? getting, well I mean I remember as well uh you know seeing Andy C walk in there and there were, he had eight boxes of records and it was uh, like him carrying two and then another four or five people are all just parading down the stairs at the end. And those stairs at the end, you don't want to mess about and take a stack with a box of records following behind do you. you think he sure. even went, do you think that he even opened three of those boxes? <laughs> do you know what? Maybe not, right? Looks good. Maybe his lunch was in one of them. Maybe he had like a nice little packed lunch in there. <laughs> do you remember Groove Rider's box? It no. was called Colossus, right? I don't know why I remember this. I can't remember nothing else about the man, right? But I can remember the name of his record box is called Colossus. And like the biggest dudes used to like help him carry that thing in. It was huge. It's like ridiculous record box size. But that was, you know, I'm used to sort of having to carry in speakers and wires and learning how to solder to fix the amplifiers. And so I learned sort of from that level and did sound engineering when I was younger and so I've always yeah. liked, I've always liked the technical side of creating music, even yeah. if I don't have the patience to learn it. That's I a bit of that. I can certainly connect with that. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I want to learn everything and I want to learn it right now. Yeah. I just um, want to read the book once and know it all. Yeah. But of course I, I it know doesn't that, work like that. I don't want to speed read it, but I don't want to have to learn how to speed read either. <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, all right. So this is interesting. So how did you, how did you kind of get into your first gig from like kind of messing around over these tunes to like actually kind of getting into, into clubs? Cause uh, certainly I was aware of you in 92 and obviously the big one that I remember from you from 92 was definitely like Fantasia, but you know, I'm sure you must've been doing bits and pieces before that. Where did that kind of start breaking into into the scene? Um, there were sort of <clears throat> smaller bars and clubs in the Birmingham, Birmingham area that were playing hardcore nights and raves and stuff. And um, like I say, my mates were into it and I wasn't really. Um, but they took me, I think the first one, was it Perception? And then there was another rave in Castle Donington. I can't remember what it's called. It might have been a dreamscape or something. Fantasia. Fantasia. Was, was it Fantasia? Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, I went to that as a punter <clears throat> with my mates and stuff and then did the things that were very popular at the time. And my whole, it, it all made sense. Like the whole world of rave opened up to me. I got why they had the breakdowns. I got why they sped up the vocals. It just all made sense. And, um, I loved it from that point going forward and just wanted to be around around that music and that movement of people that were rebelling because it was in the news all the time. There were all these ravers meeting up and having parties, all these kids, and it's really, really dangerous and stuff. And it seemed like a real movement that was anti-establishment. And yeah. um, as a rebel, I just wanted to be a part of that because, you know, I wasn't the normal walking around my neighbourhood. And so here was a place that we all felt a part of something and it was making a real societal change as well, yeah, you know, yeah. and the kids were rebelling against their parents and rebelling against the 80s of this yuppie music and, 
wine bars with carpets and mirrors everywhere and yet here we were in like really dirty trainers you would never wear anything new to a rave because yeah. <laughs> you just yeah. wouldn't you just wear the worst stuff you had because it was about dancing and stuff and so um you know that's what i loved I, about it because there was no pressures and no stresses and stuff um but I think exception who- i think my mm. mate went and grabbed he went up to the MC or something and was just like, oh, well, I'm here with my friend and she's a really good MC and stuff. And just basically just forced me onto the mic. And then I went on there and just sort of said a couple of things. And like there's like 10,000 people or something. And they just went mad. And so everyone was like, oh, God, you should totally do this all the time and and that kind of thing. And um, so I just would do like little parties and things just with my mates around Birmingham. And that's yeah. where I met G Real. He was DJing in this club where I was. And he just, he saw me on the mic and stuff and was like, yeah, I want you to be my MC. And together between him being a four deck mixer, which people didn't really see that at the time. And a female yeah. MC, he was like, yeah, we're going to, we're going to smash it. And we're going to bring something different because he wanted to always rebel do something that everybody else wasn't doing. So him turning up with me on the mic and the style of mixing that he did, you know. So we kind of, we did that. And our first one together was Dreamscape 5, I think. Wow. And we smashed it. And Murray, rest in peace, Murray, yeah. he loved it. And then we did like quite a few Dreamscapes. And because of that, then Fantasia got in touch and then it just started rolling like that because he was practicing every day, all day, every day, all day. And of a night time, he would call DJs and promoters. So he was really working at that side of it to get us gigs and, yeah. you know, hire the car every weekend and drive That's to all amazing. these places. Sometimes doing like three, three, four in a night. You know? Wow. It's, it's crazy, isn't it? You and, and full respect to him for that hustle because... Uh, and for that skill of doing four decks, right? It, it, let's let's be honest, right? For those DJs that are mixing that hardcore stuff around '92, trying to mix two of them together can be it's a that, nightmare right? at the best of times. Right. <laughs> so, it's so, not so, even sequenced no, or nothing. Like people were just no, doing no, what they wanted. You know, there was like, I tell you, what, I'm going to chuck three bars there, then maybe four. <laughs> how, how many should I put there? Do you know what? I'm going to put seven. I like the number seven. You know, it's yeah. kind of all over the shop, right? So to be able to do what he did. Uh, was was a huge challenge, right? Obviously, Carl Cox, you know, was doing the three deck thing. So, yes. if anyone's going to come and you know come with something fresh, right? Yeah, it's got to be four decks. Well, I'll tell you a little secret about the four deck thing. So he did mix on four decks. All four would be playing at the same time, but it was only for about ten to fifteen minutes because it's impossible, as you know, as a DJ, yeah. to play on four decks for like an hour or 90 minutes. You can't do that. Your brain would just turn to mush. And yeah. so he, it was, there was a section in the set when it was four decks, when he would mix on the four decks. But generally for the rest of the set, it was three. So yeah. he was always playing on three decks all the time. But when he yeah. went on to four, that's when he was really working and, cutting and mixing yeah. and just providing sort of like different breaks and things which people don't realize a lot of those break patterns he's actually in the mix with that but because he's doing it so seamlessly they just think it was part of the track so yeah. a lot of the time yeah. people didn't even really realize how technical he really was yeah and that and you know what it, it's a bit like you know it's funny we talked about dmc earlier and the dmc routines you know you you no one dances to dmc routines you know it's a watch and observe yeah. and admire thing right and so i get that right you know here's 10 15 minutes where i'm going to show you exactly what i can do and keep the floor moving as best as possible but let's move around that and make sure there's a nice kind yes. of groove and flow going around so yes. it, even from a dj perspective maintaining that for an hour versus the floor trying to keep up with that as well um it sounds yeah. like that was definitely a very good balance of of doing it um, yeah so so did you guys used to like meet up and practice and stuff or were you just kind of like right g's got his set i'm just gonna rock up and just go for it no we both practiced individually a lot he practiced all the time and i practiced all the time and so when we came together we were both really really quite sharp at what we were doing 
Um, yeah. But I did go to his place and watch him a lot. So when he was mixing behind me, I didn't have to look to see whether he was in the mix or not. I could, I just knew yeah. certain yeah. routines. He might work out a little routine or something and show me like, oh, I've got this. This is when, when I do this, I'll go into the four decks, let everybody know this is what's happening. And then, yeah. so we worked things through, but we tried to also keep it as freestyle energy because that made us nervous which i think that nervous energy it comes through as a performer like yeah. it really carries across to the crowd that you really care and yeah. there's nothing yeah. there's nothing worse than seeing somebody bored on stage to me yeah, yeah. wearing sunglasses I, I, yeah. and not being that bothered like what are you, you're literally living the dream you're living your yeah. own dream let alone most people's dream is to be on stage living their dream or whatever and so the least you could do is like appreciate that and be grateful i get yeah, it yeah. i've been tired and moody as well on on tour <laughs> but especially yeah. back in those days yeah. like if you're not bringing excitement in the 90s when you're young then what are you yeah. doing exactly you know? well this that's interesting i want to talk about that a little bit more because of it feels like that dreamscape was probably quite a pivotal moment, right? That was the first, would I say that was the first major event that you guys did together? Yeah. yeah. What, what was it like kind of, you know, in, in the green room for, for want of a better phrase for you guys kind of leading up to that event and, and walking through those doors, knowing what was I was gonna, crapping my pants. I was crapping my pants. It was my first time at like a, a major rave, knowing I'm going to be on the mic for like a whole thing rather than just going to the rave and jumping on and having a bit of a laugh. And um, I remember I was young. I, was, I wasn't I was even legally allowed to be in the party. I think I was 17, 16, 17 oh, really? at this time. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't even supposed to be at these raves, but I was emceeing there. And um, I remember walking in and the heat blast and the sweat that was dripping off the ceiling. And I hadn't really seen that many people with their faces all gurning and stuff, you know, because I was from hip hop and reggae and stuff, so we didn't really see that. So for me to see like, you know, 10,000 people them. all gurning at me while I'm on stage, I'm sure I think I wore leather or so, like the really worst thing to ever do, you know, right? First and last time I ever wore leather to the <laughs> rain. But, and it was so hot and sweaty yeah. and I was so nervous. Um, but I don't get stage fright, so I get mm. nervous, but I'm not, like, terrified. And I remember when we first started, like, the whole room changed. Like, just the energy of the whole room changed, and people were so happy to see us. And they were so welcoming to me, and everyone was really encouraging, saying, you know, they've never seen a girl on the mic before, and, and so, I mean... Even now, I still get that. And it's like 30 years later, it's like you lot still don't really get to hear that many female MCs, you know. Yeah. But yeah. to come from, you know, another musical scene where it's not the most welcoming to walk into a room and there's thousands of people who are like welcoming me like I've been there their whole life and really excited to see me and stuff. And so that was really encouraging. And I definitely wanted to be a part of something that was so welcoming mm -hmm. and warm uh, and that's you know that you know we talked about all the different aspects of the of the culture and the music and the, the you know using it as a, to rebel against all the 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 bullshit from from the 80s but it was also just a massive cultural uh, breakdown, you know, black, white, Asian, all different cultures were coming together, football hooligans and, you know, hairdressers, yes. you know, all yeah. aspects of people, you know, all of that was left at the door. Uh, and, and that wasn't something that was really seen in the UK, you know, up until that point. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it really was like that, that perfect situation and 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 like you say when you see people like and they won't welcome you that warmly you know they want you to do well and that's like ah oh, okay yes all right, all right. and i've got to say that's pretty much been how i felt for my whole career is i've just felt that publicly i'm wished well you know and that i'm not expected to be there but they're, they're happy that i'm there and like yeah. that I exist rather than 
the other way around with that whole like oh here she is it's probably a bit more like that now but when <laughs> i first started out they were really happy that i was there <laughs> yeah yeah well i do believe that people are still happy that you're there i think there now. might be a couple yeah 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 there's definitely <laughs> some Ooh, but you know i mean you're not winning if you're not annoying somebody right I mean, did you did you meet any uh, any resistance, you know, from from other MCs or other people, you know, that were trying to, you know, be a bit protective of the scene, or did you find that, you know, promoters and other DJs were were like the ravers and were kind of welcoming you in into it yeah. as well? Pretty much, yes. But I think because I was there specifically with one DJ and we were like mm -hmm. an act, it was like showtime, and yeah. so. I didn't really have to go through the same f fighting. Like people would try and take the mic off me or not give me the mic, but then he just wouldn't play a tune. He's just going to yeah. stop the tune and say, yeah. give her the mic. And then, so I had a lot of support having a mentor in that situation that stopped me from having to go similar steps to the guys. Plus I'm not a man, so I'm not in competition with them. Whether they saw me as a gimmick or whether they just thought I'm not going to be around for very long or they're not really that bothered because I wasn't affecting their career because there were so many parties happening. We were all yeah. really busy. So the competitiveness wasn't the same. You know, everybody had like three gigs every Friday and every Saturday. So there wasn't really time to for that much competitiveness. I know yeah. there was about the sets you know like gee he always wanted to smash it and have the best set and leave the next dj that was coming on after us baffled like if they weren't like a bit Ooh, what are we gonna do now he was disappointed he was vexed yeah. if i went to give the mic to the other mc and that mc didn't give me a little like or like well done or whatever yeah. he would berate me the whole way home like oh when i played that tune you could have said this or you could have done that like he was he was a hard ass to be yeah. polite yeah. and a bit yeah. of a dick if I'm being yeah. impolite, you know, but he just wanted, his competitive side was so strong and he just wanted to just be the best and just have the wickedest set of the night. Um, and we weren't really paid a lot of money. And so to bump our money up, I used to sell tapes. We, well, we used to sell tapes outside yeah. the club of our sets and different sets and stuff like that. So I would like, you know, get 20 quid, but then I'd probably make 30, 40 quid from selling tapes. Yeah, nice. You yeah, know, you outside, go. right? Got to hustle, right? Always hustle. So, so, yeah, so the more, the better set we did, then the more tapes we'd sell outside as well. So there was like many, many reasons to it. But yeah, he was so competitive. We just had to be the best. There's no yeah. question. Well, you know, it's hard to work with someone there, but it can also be very rewarding, right? Because it's it's yeah. good to have that that direction and push push forward. Um, what what's is there like a real standout set that 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 you guys did together? You were like, yeah, that that I'm never forgetting that one. I think the first one, that one, and um, the first Jungle Fever as well. Like we played, well, we played the very first two jungle fevers but yeah the first jungle fever you know we're driving down from birmingham it's this big club we've pulled up outside there's like all these black people outside this club oh god what's going on and um that was something because of the london cocky um attitude a lot of londoners are quite london centric so if you're coming from outside london into here you either are amazing or you know the promoter or there's something wrong while you're there rather than right. it's actually because we're really good while we were there and so um yeah that that one was good to sort of um make a lot of the londoners you know realize that it isn't just about them yeah that was nice and what so that's interesting. So obviously you've talked about kind of dreamscape which was you know predominantly kind of hardcore and jungle fever obviously was jungle there was obviously a, a big 92 saw a huge change in the music or specifically the tempo right you know it's kind of going from like 130 by the end of it, it was up to sort of 160 and then 93 you know was a big change for the music you know you had more darker influences you know jungle was definitely you know that was the birth of it and that was really kind of coming in what was your kind of perception of this music how are you feeling as this kind of music's changing in that time 
I loved it because it was bringing my love of ragga and reggae dance hall into the rave thing. So it was sort of bringing two things that I really, really loved together and um, making it much cooler instead of, um, you know, the sort of more northern, lots of white people listening to like very sped up chipmunk lyrics and that hardcore sound. Um, and so, yeah, it did sort of segregate out a little bit. Um, yeah. But because I'm mixed race, I'm comfortable with that side and I'm comfortable with that side. So I wasn't really that bothered. But I did notice it started splitting. Like the music you would hear up north was different from the music down south. And the music you would hear there was different from there. And then the raves switched from having like Easy Groove, Carl Cox, Slip Mat, g Real, DJ Rap, Frost, all on the same in the same room all night. Yeah. It then split where you would have Carl Cox and Easy Groove in one room and then Groove Rider and these lot in another. And those two rooms wouldn't interact with each other. I noticed that started happening and um, I didn't like it very much. But the the most, um, the biggest influence for me sort of pulling back was G got quite sick. He had kidney failure. And um, he used to like do dialysis and wow. um, like, what do you call it? Fluid bags. He would attach the fluid bag to himself and hang it in the car on our way to gigs and wow. have to pull the car over so he could be sick or he would be working and just, I'd just look and he would be beyond, I couldn't see him, which meant he was just throwing up basically yeah. during his set and stuff. Wow. So then he got quite sick. So then we stopped um, working together and um, I decided I wanted to like move to London and be a massive lesbian. Yeah. So that best place for it, apparently. I mean, really. And um, so, yeah, we stopped. I stopped sort of doing that around 94. It start, he started getting really, really quite sick in 94. And yeah, I think. Yeah. So that's kind of why that stopped. So at the very sort of explosion of jungle was when him and I were sort of just coming down yeah from being yeah. really really popular and really busy into yeah. obviously not being able to do so much and that was a sad time but i do remember things segregating a bit and splitting and it wasn't so much like peace and love and hugging each other and rubbing vicks on each other and all of that it was like you try and rub Vix on someone in a jungle rave and watch what happens to you you know <laughs> can you imagine you wouldn't even <laughs> want to walk past someone smelling of Vix, let alone rub it on them if you were there with your white gloves and horn and they're all just pointing <laughs> laughing at you and you're like what so, um, so yeah there. i noticed i noticed that yeah it started happening yeah. and I, I didn't like it because it was bringing too much animosity and negative energy to something that for me, it had like a, a pure innocence to it, you know, as much as, of course there were wrong ends, but it was just very different, you know, going to a hardcore rave at the sanctuary was different from going to jungle fever in London, you know, very different atmospheres and stuff. And yeah. so, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really like when Jungle had that stronghold and then when it went really popular after General Levy, I was out. Oh, so you, really. that was it. And then so you decided to kind of take, duck out of it for... Yeah, well, I wasn't you, uh... really... About three, two or three years, which in dance music is like a lifetime, you know, the way yeah. it speeds and changes and the vibe changes and stuff. And so, yes, I left when it was just sort of, they were just pulling any old Trojan sample out and just putting a beat under it and calling it jungle. And it was just, there was like jungle hits adverts on the TV and all of that, you know. And so I like a bit more technical, darker form of music. So I went, I liked Bookham at that point. Yeah. Bookham, five o'clock in the morning sets perfect um, do you know what it's funny with bookham right you know i went to all the dreamscapes and went to all, all those events and i never I'll, I'll be honest i never appreciated bookham uh at the time but yeah. i appreciate him now for what he did because 
you know, there was so much energy going on around, you know, whether it was hype or slip mat or whoever it was. And Booking came in with these just kind of these smooth rollers. And, 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 and as a oh God, 18, 19, 20, whatever I was, you know, you wanted just balls to the wall, let's kind of go for yes. it. But as you go older, you know, actually, it's, it's the good looking record stuff that really has stood the test of time. Like you can hear yeah. stuff now from like kind of Peche and those guys that go, wow, like this, yeah. this still sounds crisp right now. Yeah. And Comrade, uh, excuse me, um, Comrade, the style of emceeing that he was doing as well. Like he, I think, is probably the most underrated MC that we have. That's not mentioned at all by people. But without Comrade, there wouldn't be DRS. Without Comrade, there wouldn't be, you know, a lot of the ones that they sort of say they're the deeper, more intelligent, lyrical MCs. They wouldn't exist without Comrade because he was on there saying deep stuff. Like 93, 94, 95, he was doing that instead of yelling, you know, which it's all right to have the words of encouragement and that. But yeah, yeah, yeah Comrade yeah. and Bookham are very, very underrated for what they used to bring for being as individual as they were and original. Nobody sounded like that. Nobody played jazz influences in hardcore. You don't care. Yeah, but yeah. he did it. He brought jazz to the rave. Yeah. Like, who was brave enough to do that back then? Nobody. So, you yeah. know, I have a lot of respect for that. Yeah, for sure. And if especially if you think, you know, that jazz influence in drum and bass around sort of kind of 96 was then huge. You know, it was absolutely it was, Peche yeah. and all them like exploded and were like these superstars. And, you know, um, what was it? Talking Loud and all of that started recognising yeah. drum and yeah. bass and crust and people like that for being the musical geniuses that they are. You know, it wasn't just some young kids ripping off their parents records and speeding them up anymore it was like real original compositions um started coming into it um a lot more and that's what i liked that side of it so i listened to the music a lot <clears throat> excuse me i just didn't go out to the parties so much yeah i didn't really yeah. like the vibe at the parties but I still listen to the music and stuff but i was working a lot with um on the gay scene and working at R and B parties and doing pride parties and um bit of house music and stuff like that, you know. So I was still doing stuff but just not as intense. I was grieving for G Real as well at that point. Ninety when did he pass? Ninety six, I think. Ninety six, ninety seven. So yeah, it was a while. Yeah, um, yeah, that must have been, you know, a very difficult time for you considering, you know, how much of a relationship and, you know, the great success that you guys had. Yeah. Right? Yes, at first I kind of um, I semi-retired because who was I going to MC for, you mm. know? Because I was all these raves because somebody requested me to be there with them. And so I wasn't really known individually, you know? And so that was really tricky and... I didn't think that I wanted to do it without him, but um, Tanya Lee from UMC Agency, she was um, really encouraged me to keep going and handled gigs for me on my own and signed me and stuff. And um, I'm really grateful for her for doing that because it gave yeah. me, you know, the confidence to be an MC on my own rather than just part of a double act, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And what, what do you remember? What was that first booking that you had uh, that you were doing solo, for want of a better phrase? It, it might have been with DJ Wildchild. Okay. It might have been with her playing, probably going to Germany or somewhere. Somewhere. Yeah, somewhere like that. I think so. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, the 90s was a hell of a time, right? <laughs> so there's a lot that I don't remember. Yeah, well, I think so. I did my show last night, and someone said, "If you remember the nineties, then, then you weren't there." It's like, yeah, fair <laughs> yeah, enough. Pretty much. Can't yeah, really that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> but did you um, like? When was it? Do you remember the first time you went abroad? Um, my first gig abroad was with G Real. We went to Toronto, ninety four, I think that was, and um, yeah, we couldn't believe it. These so far away you know like canada and when we got there they they knew who we were because somebody had come to england and got a tape yeah. 
and it was due in a chickaboo tape or a tape pack and they took it back and them and all their mates, you know, all the chill outs and all the parties were listening and passed it all around each other. And so they were like, we've got to put on a party and bring these people over. And so that's what they did. And so when we got there, there were all these ravers, like proper raving, um, but speaking with Canadian accents and were like, you know, treating us as if we were like pop stars. But it was just this group of like 50 clubbers that yeah. all sort of put their money in and got their local drug dealer mate to fund it as well and and then they got us they got us out there and we'd That's never amazing. been abroad together before so that was really quite special because it's funny isn't it? back then like you know we didn't really go abroad that much you know going to spain was like a, just a <gasps> yeah we're getting on this big metal bird and you know it's going to fly through the sky and take us somewhere else yeah. you know the yeah, world you're getting was, paid. Was a bigger place you're getting paid to go and do play music what that we were doing here for like 100 quid and then suddenly we've got this gig somebody's requesting us to go to canada and paying for our visas and our flights and our hotel like i couldn't believe it it was like honestly a dream come true yeah. but i'm still a little part of me when i get gigs i still have a little like oh my god i can't believe they're still like booking me kind of thing still you know <laughs> yeah it's amazing yeah it's 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 great I, I actually had i know one of the promoters that we're both talking to independently i actually suggested you and he messaged me today said i've locked in chick bell i was like yes oh time. i think i might know yeah my agent gave me a, a message earlier and yeah, said and when i looked at the, he said this was their previous party and i saw your name on there yeah, it's, so i said it's, yes because I saw your name, I said yes to the gig. Nice, it's amazing. You you will not be let down. It's a phenomenal crowd down there. We'll we'll give some more details when uh, when we're allowed to uh, splurge that one out there. Um, yeah. All right. So, uh, what what year is it when you kind of start uh, coming back into the fold? When was that? Um, I would say ninety eight, ninety nine. 99 I got a request to go on tour um in America and it was um a called Kung Fu Knowledge Tour and they were doing like 28 30 gigs in different cities around America and Canada and stuff and I was the only MC that was booked for the whole thing I was the only artist wow. that was there for the whole six weeks and wow. everybody else came so like Randall came for a week um Daisy was there for two weeks. Adam F came for a week. There were loads of different people as well as American drum and bass artists. So like, different people would join the tour and leave and stuff. Yeah, but we yeah. were just on it, on this bus for like six weeks going around. And that was a life changing experience as yeah. well um, to do that. So yeah, shouts out because that was Rachel from Knowledge that put my name forward for that tour because she'd seen me work with Daisy who's also a foundation artist, but because she's out in Bristol, people sort of overlook how long she's been around for and what she's done for this scene and everything. But because of her, I got to, you know, go and tour America. And then she took me on as her MC and we got an agent in the States together and stuff. And so, yeah, we got visas and was out there every two weeks doing gigs in America. I know, right? And That's um, amazing yeah especially trying to get a really visa good. out there <laughs> yeah that it was a lot and it was about three grand for this piece of paper but you could go in and out as many times as you wanted to and earn money there and everything so that was like game changer for us yeah. but um yeah i'm i'm really lucky in the fact that um, the DJs that I work with have requested for me to be there. So I work with people that want me to actually be on the mic for them, like G-Real, Daisy, Jazzy B, um, you know, and that's really helped. And, and of course, yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I wasn't really going to, like, say, because you're really legendary, so I was, like, going <laughs> to drop that in. But, um, oh, stop it. <laughs> but, yeah, it's always really helped me out having mentors, yeah. that want me to be there and, you know, encourage me to, like, to 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 just be myself and stuff and not really, like, tell me what to say and things like that, you know. Um, so I'm really grateful that I've had mentors because I think without them I wouldn't have had the same journey. No. Uh, and, you know, I think to, su 
to I don't use survive is not the right word to to be in this industry uh, uh, and to be able to make a living out of it for ten years is not easy. Um, yeah. To be able to do it for 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 three decades um, is it, amazing. Really, you know, there's 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 still a handful of 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 guys that are out there now. You know, the sort of Frost, Ray Keith, those guys. You know, they're still out there. The granddads. Making, okay. Yeah, the granddad, yeah, literally <laughs> and physically, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Who are making <laughs> who, who are making it. And it's just, you know, amazing that, you know, some of these guys, I've just started reading uh, Ray Keith's book. I'm only about five or six chapters in. Is it um, good? It's the, I, I'm, I'm kind of at the point where he's just leaving school. The bit that always gets me is just, you know, there's one thing about, you know, the musical journey, but then there's that personal stuff. And obviously I like doing a book because a book, the person who's writing has got their own rails as to what they're going to put in the book and not, and it's, you know, it's not an easy childhood by, by any means. Like the same with rap, you know, I was actually really, really shocked uh, to hear the kind of, you know, upbringing that you had and through right. all that diversity what she's managed to achieve is just, you know, is just amazing. Um, but yeah, you, I mean, look, obviously you've known Ray for years, but you know, if, if you're a reader uh, from the first, you know, five, six chapters, it's a very, very good read indeed. Right. Yes. I've heard that his one is, is quite good. I think he was a bit more active because the only thing about a lot of musical autobiographies is they're not written by the person. Yeah, uh, you know they're written by somebody else, and the person gives them a lot of sort of stories, or they interview them, or whatever. So sometimes it can just feel like a really long interview, more than an in-depth insight into actually what they're like. Because yeah. if it's only like, oh, and then I did this, and then I did this, and then I did this, it's like I actually want to hear about their regrets. I want to hear the thing that they turned down that they wish they never did, or I want to yeah. hear about the time when you know, they they handled a situation, you know, incorrectly or, you know, any regrets. They could have not been so yeah, violent yeah. or they could have not been sexist or they could have supported another artist more instead of bending the needle when they're about to get on the decks, you yeah, know. Yeah, Um Because I've seen happened? some really shady... Yeah, 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 I've seen that more than once. And wow. uh, very well-known people used to do it but yeah just bend the stylus arm slightly people used to do it to do real as well because we were getting such good things one time you know the headphone jack thing or if you get your headphones or they break or whatever and the dj there that's going to play after you standing right there and he said oh can i use that please and the driver was like that and said nope can't do it can't do it we've been about to go on and i've seen the dj bend the stylus arm I like so. Wow. Yeah, and, and the MCs punching each other in the face and stuff like this. <laughs> ridiculous. So I would like to just know that these are autobiographies are also saying, pardon me, some of the more negative aspects of of their their own personality because we're not all one sided of you know. Yeah, oh, I had a yeah. rough time. Then I got into music, and now I'm a millionaire and I'm successful. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, you know, so I hope that some of these books are honest. Yeah, for, uh, I mean, I've read a few of them. Frost was definitely like that. Frost was very open and honest. Uh, and and he, he says in the book, I, I can't, there's a lot of things that I can't say, but a lot of the stuff he was very truthful uh, about. And, that, and that's, I don't want to hear that you didn't say, because it's a book yeah. you're supposed to yeah. say. This is the one time you've got to say, even if you put a big allegedly at the end of the chapter. Or whatever it is i yeah. want to hear about that i want to hear why you punched that guy in the face yeah i want to hear why you kept certain people out of the scene or why you didn't want that man working at the same event as you why you yeah. know so for me maybe because i've been in so i know a bit more of the personal things but yeah. if they're never ever mentioned in these books and those are the things that molded us into what we are today you know, we've had fallouts. We're all a massive family, really. So we have yeah. fallouts. We get on with each other. We don't get on with each other. He gets with your ex. You get with his ex. He's like, like what about all of that? You know, it's really helped and hindered the scene, all the personal, intricate sort of little details and that of how people communicate and how we all sort of like live together within the scene that we've we've all created, really. 
Every yeah. experience you have, good or bad, right, it shapes who you are going forwards. Yeah, it really does. So, yeah, I couldn't write a book because I would just want to be so honest that it would just get me into the most amount of trouble. Like, most people would probably not want to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you what know. Would be the what would be the title of your book? They're all a bunch of pricks. <laughs> <laughs> Including I mean, me, it. brackets <laughs> including me underneath. We're all pricks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're all a bunch of pricks, but we had a really good time. Yeah, there you go. Nice. Well, that's uh, that's. I tell you, because who? What's interesting about these ones is uh, Dave Jenkins, uh, who's a very oh, right. old friend of mine. Yeah, he's he's written for Mixmag. Uh, um, uh, UKF and all these guys. He's uh, co-written. He's helped it, but it's definitely in Ray's voice. Uh, voice. He's also done uh, Fantasies. One Fantasies was a, re a really good book. You know what? I, I was talking to you about before about this. Like, I just crave this information. Just understanding all these different unique stories. You know, everyone's got a. Uh, you know, there's one thing that happened in the middle, and we're all dancing in the middle of it, right? But there's all these different views and perceptions about what happened. You know, throughout that era, and that that's what I hope to kind of achieve is that you know through all these interviews is just try and fill a little slice of those as we uh, as we go along. Nice. Yeah, I'm sure you could you could probably have a book yourself, you know, with all the the stories and the people you've met and the raves you've worked at. I mean, you've been to more parties than I have, you know. I'd probably do so, an audio book. I can't be asked to write one. Yeah, <laughs> you've got to write it before you can read it. <laughs> I was just I was talking to uh, Chris Lunacy because I've just I just finished his book, uh, which actually is an amazing book. It's definitely it? written by him. Uh, he's very open and honest about it. There's uh, there's all the the whole situation that he had with the Smarties and Night Force. It's just you know suffering with depression and you know just very honest and and yes. candid with with the information. Oh, that's and, good. Uh, yeah, it, it was it was a really good read. And again, you know, his view is very different to Hype's view, which is very different to your view, which, you know, sure, everyone crosses paths at certain points. Yeah. Uh, but only, you know, only each individual has had their own journey, right? Um, yes. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's and we all to took a load of pills and, you know, like the sort of come downs and the depression and the highs and lows of being in front of 30,000 people going crazy and then you're at home on a Tuesday and, you know, whatever you've got to clean the toilet thinking, yeah you're cleaning happens? your toilet thinking like oh god like some people think yeah. i'm quite special you know yeah. you go home and you're a nobody but that's good i like that roller coaster journey because i never really think that i'm anything anyway so i always like being brought back down to earth you should um there's a, a great documentary called um slave to the rhythm <laughs> why we dj which is a uh, oh. again um it's it's about 45 minutes long uh, it's online it's a really good documentary it's very behind the scenes look at um you know we all see on social media these 30 45 second clips of just everyone losing their shit and everything just going mental and crazy but you don't see the 12 18 hours travel to get <sighs> to that point you yeah. don't see the you know the three hours sleep and then you're picked up and then you're traveling all the way back no um, food again, no sleep yeah no respect no treated yeah. humanely like you are treated a bit sort of badly sometimes and expected to you know keep smiling throughout and yeah. take the disrespect because you know you've got this privileged life and you're very lucky so then some people it seems want to sort of put the boot in because it's like you know who do you think you are and it's like well actually i think i'm a human who deserves common decency right yeah. but sometimes even just asking for like a drink you'll be called a diva and stuff when it was just like i've not had a drink of water for five hours yeah, like yeah. I just need to drink of water, and they don't realise at that moment. And you're like, I fucking want a fucking water. They think you're just having a temper tantrum rather than yeah. It's a catalogue of errors and a series of disasters. And now you're at this point, and the promoters told you that they haven't got the money to pay you, but you're there, and you still got to do the gig. Or yeah, do you not I... do it? Or do you do it? Do you let all the people down? Because you've travelled all that way, do you just turn around and walk off, or do you play the set because it's not their fault because they bought the tickets to a party that's crashed? It's so a, it's a real dilemma, right? Yeah, there really is. But I think if you just think about the ravers first and hold on to that, because I think you'll regret not making ravers 
the rave is happy at the end of your career, you'll think about that more than, you know. Yeah. It, oh, I got one up on that guy because I walked out the rave. Yeah. Was. Yeah. yeah. Do you know, it's interesting here you say that, you know, this is one thing that I do remember from you as an MC from the very early days, you know, you were always very positive towards the crowds. Yeah. You know, we really love you. You know, you were really, yeah. you know, it was very... I think, you know, for me, you've got that really great balance of hosting and hype and excitement, but it was all positive and love and, 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 and yeah. part of that scene, right? It, it, you just slotted straight in and worked really yeah, well. Yeah, because that's, think... that's what it was about, you know, and from our first went to raves and stuff and people were really lovely towards me and open and welcoming. And that's, that's kind of how we should all feel when we go out. We should all feel safe and happy. That yeah. we're allowed to like express ourselves and oh no he's gonna leap and release release that stress and just shut the world out. There's so many of us that just need just a few hours break from in here or from our external lives or whatever. Some people are going through like hell, but they get to that rave and that's that five hours where they're not that life is just behind them they can forget about it and that's escapism is pretty much what this is all about we just get to yeah. escape and just be anything we want to be and you know i really believe in that as much as it makes me sound like really hippie-ish no like, I, don't. I still I... really believe in in that freedom of expression and i'm it's really nice to hear you say that because actually i think that it can get easily lost along the way right you know, it starts becoming a job and a chore and, uh, you know, you lose, it's easy to lose sight, especially when someone's been in something for so long. What was the original reason why you did this? And also, why are those people that have paid money to come and see you? What do they want? You know, sure, yeah. they want to see you, but dig a little bit deeper. They've come here for all those reasons that you said, right? You know, it might just be because there are music fish, uh, aficionados that want to hear uh, great things. Or it might be someone that's just having a really shit time. And it's like, this is my time. Get off my nut and just push all that bullshit yeah. away. And I can just be, be focused on me and music for the, yes. for the night. Exactly. Because that is what it's about. Like, if you're... Like, we all want to be angry and express, like, all types of sides to our personalities. But ultimately, I think the human experience is to come together and be sociable and interact with each other and spread love, you know, that whatever that means to you, whether it's, you know, that breakdown or whether it's having a dance with somebody or you just had a chat with somebody in the toilets or whatever brought you joy that's yeah. what it's about and as long as that joy wasn't at the detriment of somebody else's joy i yeah. don't think that you know anyone should be judged for that plus right. i think you know my lifestyle i'm half irish half jamaican from birmingham gay as fuck you know in a straight that's... world you know yeah, yeah. and so yeah. yeah i think i've always sort of wanted to project what i wish is projected back at me which yeah. it generally is to be honest yeah but 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 that's you know treat as others as you'd like to be treated you know it's 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 been absolutely written down somewhere for centuries and centuries right exactly um i'm gonna take a little jump to the breakbeat scene which is where oh, i okay. got to meet you um yeah let's talk about how did, how did you get involved i know that you know you were doing stuff uh with rennie and that evolved. How did that all come about with you kind of coming into that scene and working in there? Okay. Well, I did a track with a guy called Timo Mars. And Rennie knew my managers at the time and really liked the track. And so he came to um, the launch of the tune um, at this party we had in this pub in Camden, I think it was. And so... Rennie came and introduced himself and said that he really liked the track and gave me a CD of Two Freaks instrumental and said, oh, we can't clear the vocal on this. Do you think you could say a sentence so we can like sample you and make the tune? And I was like, yeah, sure. And um, I went and met him and Blim 
mm-hmm. went to the studio and just sort of vibed on the tune and stuff. I said, obviously, more than the one sentence, because that's ridiculous. And so, yeah, I said more than the one sentence and vibed on it. And then, um, yeah, they sent me this tune back and that was kind of the start of it. And then before I know it, he was contacting me saying, like, oh, we've got a bit of a hit on our hands here. And do you want to come and do some MCing with me? So I was like, yeah, sure. That's kind of how it Next started, night, really. Yeah, that yeah. Was, you know, that was great. That was where I, you know, obviously I knew I was totally aware of you from before, but then it was when you started working with Rennie. Uh, uh, and then obviously you were doing a lot of work with uh, Lady Wax in Russia as well. Oh, God, yeah, you? yeah. Can't forget about the Russia massive. Bloody hell, some mad parties, those. <laughs> um, right. But yeah, yeah, it's really good. And Floor as well. I worked with Floor. Yeah. In France, DJ Floor. Yeah. I did a couple of tracks on her album. And um, Superstar Deluxe and Stabilizer. So yeah, I had sort of more tracks out in Breakbeat for like a three, four year period than anything else. You know, I was right, sort of yeah. busy enough in Breakbeat and house music and stuff as well. I was um, into MCing over that. I like MCing where in places where they don't normally have MCs. I really like that. I like to try and sound like I'm part of the record rather than shouting over the top of it. I try and like just kind of add vocals as if I'm in studio, which kind of works. Yeah, nice. So I was going to say with the house scene, how, how, you know, it's synonymous with having no MCs in house. I mean, the only time yeah. I remember hearing how uh, MCs over house was when you used to have the old kind of tribal gatherings and you'd get like Joe Peng over Sasha or stuff like that. You know, that was like wow, the last time. Joe Peng, bloody yeah. hell. It's a blast from the past. Yeah, he's a hero of mine. He ended up, because uh, he ended up doing, was it Black something? Uh, he did a band, he had a band. He had created a band after... Well, it probably would have been 2000s or something. I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, amazing band. But he, uh, John Final Junkie booked me to play at one of his nights and he said, listen, Joe Peng's going to MC for you. And I was like, that little <gasps> girly squeal. Wow, uh, wicked. Because me and him were the only two people in there. There no. was no one in there. So I was like, do you know what? I said, like, this is with Joe Peng. So I'm just going to, you know, not that I wouldn't do anything just, different anyway. I was like, I'm still yeah. playing. I'm still just going to go just for it. Just live the dream a little bit, yeah, for yeah. yourself. I said, <laughs> yeah. John, did you record that? He went, no. I went, oh. <laughs> I, ain't got, I ain't even got that. <laughs> it's always the way, isn't it? The best ones. You're like, that was wicked. I've done wicked takes in the studio and been like, yes. And they're like, oh, I forgot to press record. <laughs> Decades. So, so it sounds like you've done a few tracks. Have you ever been kind of bitten by uh, a bunk to kind of start writing your own tunes? Um, I have done. I've written an album, and yeah, I just I don't know. I don't really do self promotion very well, and so I've got. I just prefer sort of someone else going through all the bollocks, really. To be honest. Fair enough. Yeah. You yeah. turn up with a microphone. Sing your heart out, and then. Oh my god! I really need to go to the loo, and I don't know how to even bring it up. Uh, well, I think you just did. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know what? Is there any like musical interlude or something we can do? Do you know what? Do you know I can I can I can chat rubbish. You know, yeah, go for it. You know what? I tell you, I'm going to chat with a few people and see what's going on. You you get in there. Make sure (laughs) I'm going to mute you just to make sure we don't want to hear you trickling. All right. So this reminds me of the time where Fantasy uh, just took a phone call in the middle, which is brilliant. So uh, if you've got any questions you want to ask me or ask Chickaboo, fire them in the comments and I will uh, I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, I'll do a few shouts out. Roughneck69, yes, mate, big up yourself. Hope you're good. Nice to see some of the regulars in here. Uh, Rob Harmer, yes, mate, hope you're doing good. I hope Donna's all right. Uh, any chance I could get to see your squirrel, Rob? That is... It's very personal, but I will ask her when she comes back if she'll show us her squirrel. <laughs> uh, who else we got here? Uh, Paul, big up yourself. I wish the MCs and DJs have a great scene. A story about the racing. Yes, well, this is what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to find, you know, all those little nuggets of, of information and stories to see what we can, we can. Uh, do you know what? I, I was, I was, I was ready to go for uh, for forever there, Boo. You all right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was the quickest. Hang on, I don't know if you can see. 
was in his oh, little... Oh, do you know what? I, I don't know if you heard me, but literally, like, there's a, few, a couple of comments saying we want they want to see your, they want to see the squirrel. Okay, I can't really get him. He's in his little house. In his oh, little. I just saw his face then. He's, he's a little hammock. Hi. Okay. Tell us a story about this uh, about the squirrel. Well, my um, my girlfriend and her son were out in a park, and her son found him. There was three of wow. them. They found him. He was sort of like lying in the stream, twitching and stuff. And apparently, their mum had been killed, and so they called the squirrel rescue place, and you know, got a lot of advice. But they had no spaces left, and so we basically just kept them but two of them died they didn't make it through the first couple oh, of nights because they'd already been frozen they were already hypothermia and dehydrated and stuff pardon me but this is the only one this is the one left now okay. and oh, so we were said we we're going to keep him till may and then see what the squirrel rescue place say because yeah. he wouldn't have survived through the winter obviously on his own but apparently oh. squirrels aren't scared of humans naturally their parents teach them how to be scared of humans to avoid us but oh, they're not okay. scared that's why if, if you in the park and you've got some snacks or something they'll just come up to you because they're not actually scared of us i just thought they were really lazy squirrels that couldn't be bothered to go and foraging for nuts they're like yeah just well why would they get on. some yeah get some crisps a bit of hot chocolate let's give the kids <laughs> but um yeah they're kind of in between a cat um, a dog, like he's, you can play with him, and he's really scampy, and yeah. he wants to nibble and bite and jump and play. But he's also really curious and inquisitive, like a cat, you know, or climb on things and look around and stuff. So he's just started to reach adolescence, so he's getting little furry nuts, <laughs> and um, he's wiping them. He's wiping his balls on everything. <laughs> Is that a territorial um, thing or he's just, you know, that's just clean? I him. hope it is, babe. I hope it is. I hope. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just, he's just doing it because it feels nice. And that's, <laughs> that's really a lot worse than if he's just doing it for scenting and stuff. <laughs> but yeah, he's in his hammock. I'll try and get him out in a minute. Oh, at two so yeah, I've got to try and get him in on this interview. And I, he wants in. If there's, there's demand, there's nuts. demand. Rustle and nut packet. Do you know it's the same with my cats? As soon as they hear yeah. the rustling of dry food, they're like in like rockets. One of them's actually getting really too fat now. I've got to stop feeding them. Okay, let's give him a little nut. Can you see? Super cute. There you go. You're gonna come out. No, now he's pulling me because he wants me to go in the hammock with him. He's not quite worked out that we can't fit. <laughs> so when he goes in, see, he's, pull, he's pulled my hand inside. I can't get it out because he's holding on. Oh, no, bless you're going to have to let, let me go. Let, let me go. No, let me go. He can't bite me in. So there you go. He'll pull you. He tries to pull you into his cage and stuff with him. Oh, bless you. Well, there you go. There's a sideline for you, like animal rescue. <laughs> what a heart of gold you've got, huh? Nursing a squirrel. Uh, uh, I do love animals as well. I love them more than people, to be honest, because you know where you are with animals, don't you? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like... Except for goldfish. Don't trust goldfish. Mm -mm. Oh, no. They're murderous bastards, they are. <laughs> They'd kill you if they had off chance. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, do you know what? Let's um let's bring it up today, eh? Um oh I want to talk about the EQ fifty stuff that you do because that is yeah. amazing. Um equality in the DMB scene and you know you you've naturally become this amazing voice, this voice of reason. Uh, and clearly, you are not scared to call it as it is. Uh, yeah. Tell, tell us about what's going on there and uh, what's happening. Well, um, EQ50 um, is about introducing and pushing more women and non-binary people into um, drum and bass. The real big problem was that there weren't enough female non-binary music producers coming through you know there's loads of djs people can name djs but naming female producers was a bit harder and so 
if we can get people in at the roots level of making the music and then playing the music just by that um you know we're introducing more so we had a mentorship scheme with five different labels that took on a ment a mentee for two mm -hmm. years and um we did master classes and stuff production master classes with people and um yeah a two-year course with the labels working with the mentees and encouraging them and supporting them and so now at the end of it they're signed to agencies they've had tunes released on ram critical um nice and things like that and so yes now there's you know six new female non-binary producers out there successful already in their first two yeah. years having tunes released performing doing gigs getting paid and um so we're just working through now the next wave of mentees for the next one and the next group of labels that are going to take on um a mentee as well you know and support them and give them advice and just just help really because yeah. that's all we need like for me i don't want to take over the world and see only women everywhere mm. that's not a decent world i just want us to be credited and admired and respected the same as the men are you know yeah and, the scales um, need for to, me scales need to tip yeah them, right? it's just about equality we're not trying to push men out so men don't have gigs and it's just women only uh, that's ridiculous i don't want to do that just want to be included that's it yeah. we just want to be included you know and so that's what we're really pushing for equality 50 percent. you know equal 50 50 why not but for me personally outside of eq50 um i get a lot of women messaging me and talking about their abuse situations and um you know assault situations that they've had from men from djs producers whatever in dance music and yeah. after the eric murillo thing came out a lot yeah. more women feel a bit more empowered to speak up on it but still not that many because scared of you know ridicule not being believed shut out of the scene your career is over if you're a female artist and you say anything about anyone forget it and yeah. so because i have had 30 years in it and because I'm a bit more outspoken about things like that now, I wasn't before, but now I feel braver and encouraged. And because it's not about my career anymore, um, I feel I can say it without worrying about any sort of comebacks affecting me negatively. I don't really care about, about those it. a voice that, that, that don't feel like they've got the power or the strength yeah. to have a voice, right? You know, I, I tell yeah. you, know, it's like the real world, you know, it's the same with women not being able to come forward for fear of, you know, being yeah. ridiculed or losing their job or, you know, whatever yeah. it may be, you know, sh you know, it's going to be no different within the scene, you know, it's, yeah. it's amazing. And there's a lot, you've... there's a lot that's happened and like, you know, my inbox, sometimes I've cried, I've just sat and cried because I still know the, the perpetrators, you know, the accused, the alleged abusers and stuff. And so it's very difficult for me to sort of walk that line between knowing things happened, saw things happened, I know. And yeah. in today's world, trying to make people acknowledge their past behaviour. I'm not saying I want you all to go to jail, but at least acknowledge it and apologise. Or, you know, and um, all, all they're going to go to the police mm. and speak up. So that's the next stage that's about to happen you know me too is going to smash dance music in the world quite badly you know yeah. eric obviously wasn't the only one that was doing that and um i saw a journalist put a tweet up the other day saying that they're about to start a podcast um of abusers and survivors talking about their experiences in dance music and she was asking right. for people to you know tell their stories and they might have voice actors and stuff to disguise their voices right. and stuff so yeah. um so it's a safe space for them to be able to express themselves so that's going to be really good and i'm glad it wasn't me that did it because a lot of people aren't really liking me for speaking up in the way i'm speaking up the fact is though a lot of women in this scene have been asking politely for many many years and no change and yeah. so if me getting in posting your flyer with no women on it and saying there's no women on this you're a prick yeah. 
and then yeah. they get upset. They might come back and be really defensive. How should you, you shouldn't say that about me? Don't talk about me. Don't say to blah, 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 blah. But then at the next event, there's a woman or two. So something's working. Because if yeah. really, if what I'm saying is really that wrong and you're not doing anything wrong or negative, then carry on with it. Ignore me and carry on. I wish everybody would shut me up by just putting women on the lineups. Then I wouldn't have to say anything. But in this day and age, to see no women or no black people on especially UK dance music, like, yeah. how can you do that? That's really, it's it's wrong. And yeah, um, it, especially I'm here to being... call it out and I don't really care yeah. about you know, whether they don't like the way I'm saying it because that in itself is sexist because they want me to serve up what I'm saying in a way that's palatable for them. And it's mm. kind of not about them, right? Yeah. And for all the women that have been abused, punched, kicked, raped, assaulted, I think me calling people pricks for being a prick, I don't really see there being a problem with that. Yeah. But I've had a bit of blowback, some people being all upset that I've called them out. You know, they message me and stuff, but I don't really engage because I have nothing to say to somebody that's got away with something for 30 years. Yeah. You know? Listen, I, I applaud you for it. I think it's amazing that you are putting, you know, you out there because you are, you know, a, a long standing, respected member within the dance scene so to be able to have your voice uh stand up for things that aren't right you know it's not like you're like you say you know you're not asking for a tip in the complete opposite end of the balance or for something to reverse itself you can't but you know to be able to put that balance a bit in yes. there and to have that bit of influence and it's amazing to hear right that that next lineup did have a female on there or will have a black artist on there yeah you know uh, and it's you know that, that's a huge win right Absolutely. And that's the thing. It's not about me personally. I don't want to be on the flyer. I just want any anybody that is talented enough to do it because they're, oh, well, why would we put a woman on if she's not that good? And I'm not, I'm not asking you to put someone on that's not that good. You're telling me you don't know any women DJs that are brilliant? Mm. Come on. That's stupid. And why, why has gender got anything to do with music anyway? You know? Like, bloody hell, you don't say to Destiny's Child, oh, you should have a man in it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Things are what they are yeah, because yeah. they are. But when it's like a lineup where every DJ is different, playing a different style or every DJ is playing music, does it matter what gender they are? You know? Mm. But, yes, just like people say about racism, oh, you just want black people everywhere. That's not the thing. We just want to have acknowledgement and inclusion. We're not trying to like throw everybody out and only have black people everywhere. Just like mm. with women, we're not trying to throw all the men out and just have women. Because that wouldn't be fair either. I want yeah. equality. I want yeah. it to be good for men and women and non-binary people. I want more gay people to get into drum and bass. We love drum and bass, gay people love it, but it's not safe for us to go to the parties, especially yeah. openly gay men as well it's a very dangerous place to be and so you know i'm pushing for that as well i work with unorthodox and queer rave as well um two queer gay drum and bass events that are really pushing for change and inclusion you know way more than i'm doing you know i've not put on a gay drum and bass party so i'm really happy that people feel brave enough and safe enough to like have that and we mm. don't, I don't, I'm not saying I want to go to Jungle Fever and have it as a gay party. But yeah. what I am saying is, why can't we have a gay party where there's jungle music? I'm not trying to change what's already is established from what it is. We just want to have our bit included in that, you know. You know, what it just comes down to something quite simple, really. It shouldn't matter what your sexual flavour is or your ethnic background is. You should be able to walk into a venue that plays the music you love and enjoy the night and be able to walk out. Dumb. Yeah, because if you're not going to the club to fuck somebody, it doesn't really matter what's going on in the club. You're going there to dance to music. So it shouldn't really matter what anybody's doing with their sex life or their gender or their anything. It's irrelevant. 
I remember yeah. being in raves. There was like you were saying, there's all sorts of people. There's differently abled people. There's all sorts of ethnic people. There were broke ass people who were like living on the streets. There were rich ass people that lived in mansions or had private you know education and there were so many of us just all mixed together to try and just give it that to the government that was saying we weren't allowed to dance together yeah right and, and they managed to, to succeed the, but the government succeeded because they split us all up divided mm. us all up well you're gay you're over there you like techno you're over there you like drama bass you're over there you're black you're there you're a woman you're there and that whole thing what they've done to the rave culture they they managed to do that but now we're pulling it back again now i think by putting on queer parties by putting on illegal parties by having a squat party but all these different things that's how rave started you know i think it's coming back to being something much more cohesive and inclusive i hope yeah. so i hope i'm not just being romantic about it but mm. i believe and i'm always an optimist that you know we will get back to that it doesn't matter about what you are outside what are you in here and in here you're a raver yeah and that's it yeah that's it whether you're a dj yeah. or a promoter whether you're all we're all still ravers djs are nerds you lot proper <laughs> nerds just musical nerds who just happen yeah. to play what you love and you collect for that and then it suddenly switches from being a nerd to being cool yeah right but actually we're all nerdy we're all what? nerdy musicians that get a bit watery eyed if we hear you know n type yeah. for example yeah. Yeah. if somebody says they got that on vinyl you'll see a little tear <laughs> right uh, listen <laughs> like you know it was only a few decades ago right the dj used to sit in the corner with a bunch of seven inch records and was facing the wall, you know, that's yeah. like, you know, you were just there to provide music, you know, you yeah. weren't the center of attention in any shape or form, you know, that yeah. kind of evolution of the superstar DJ, you know, throughout the nineties. Uh, but like you say, you know, still just musical nerds, right? Absolute nerds. Judge Jules, Tommy, come on. Don't tell me they're not, they're, like nobody's a bigger nerd than that, than two right there. Yeah. You know, like absolute nerd. Giles Peterson, actually, he's pretty nerdy. But, you know, just because it, it kind of turned into this where people can build careers off it, it then changed into something else rather than we are actually providing a public service. And I think that's how we should always look at ourselves. Because mm. if the public, if that crowd didn't gel with you or you didn't like being there or whatever, I think you have to have a serious look at what you're doing with your life. You yeah. Know? yeah, and I think um, the lockdown has made a lot of people. It shot a lot of amateurs out, and it brought a lot of amateurs that were professionally minded out. Mm -hmm. So the ones that were just doing it for praise and credit and money got shut down, and the ones that were doing it from their bedroom because they love it and were doing live streams and doing all of that through the lockdown for nothing, they're the ones that hopefully now are going to be rewarded for all that. Effort yeah, and there, stuff. There, there is a guy, God, I can't remember his name. Uh, it just ended up being a massive hit on Twitch. And he was just playing loads of old 45s, like uh, Soul, Rare Groove Funk. And, you know, it was, it's, it's weird that it's a novelty that someone plays vinyl, considering where we've all come from. But it is now for, for a lot of reasons. Um, and he's now, like, I heard he's doing, like, you know, corporate gigs and getting, like, amazing money and he's playing at this out. And I just thought, like, brilliant. That's brilliant. How great is that? You know, even in the worst, you know, one of the worst situations the UK has been faced with in many, many years, out with the world, actually, right? You yeah. Know, no one could go out. No one could do anything. People are still finding ways. And it's, it's funny, right? Um, people that didn't expect to succeed and do that they've just done what they've loved bang away you go uh, and, yes. and others have you know have readjusted themselves rebalanced themselves i remember speaking to one dj and he was saying like i've toured every weekend for the last 20 years i was bored senseless i was playing the same music i just lost all my groove for it he said but i wouldn't stop because you know like with most artists you know relentless in working pushing themselves hustling and um he said this forced me to stop he said, I had a good look at what I did, questioned what I was all about, 
what music I'm playing, getting back in the studio. He said, now could not wait to get back out there. And I was like, that is an amazing thing that I love to hear is that, you know, there's, it's a shit situation, but we've been able to find, you know, some yeah. great personal truths in inside yes. there. Uh, and, and then be able to go, right, I was heading down this way. Now I'm going to go slightly to a different direction. Yes, because that's how it started. It was about dedication and passion. When we're all going around getting 50 quid, 100 pounds, if you got 200 yeah. quid, it was like, oh my God, I got 200 quid. Like, I remember the top ones, you couldn't pay over 800 pounds for anyone. I remember Carl Cox was 800 quid. You know, Sasha, 800 quid. Now, you're lucky if you get these guys for like 10 grand, you know? Yeah. And so... That's the thing, isn't it? When it became about money and a career instead of about passion and just being grateful to be there, there's a big difference. But um, it's hard, isn't it? Because at the same time, if that's your career, you need to pay your bills. And who exactly loves, right. you know, any job, if you worked in a factory or you worked in a shop or you worked in, in an office or whatever, you would be bored after 20 years in the same office, Yeah, you know? doing the same thing with people getting really, really drunk and high around you while you're trying to do your job. So at some point, the pleasure does diminish quite a lot. Yeah, That's that's when I think it's quite dangerous as an artist because mm. you'll keep going when actually you probably should have hung your headphones up, just taken a let break someone... for a couple of years Yeah, and let someone else come and have a few gigs and then you're like, actually... I like what they're doing. I think I'm better than that. I'm going to come back. Yeah. You know? Find find a new passion for it. That's, yeah. you know, that's, that's, that's at the heart of everything that we do. Right. If you've got great passion for it, is he all right? Is exactly. he going to jump down? Are we going to see the squirrel? Now so, he's on top of his thingy. I'm going to see if I can get him down. Bring him he's, down. He's so we're still getting comments. We still, we still want the squirrel to get involved. Still want the squirrel. What's I know, his name pretty by much, the way? Or... He's just called the squirrel. Come here. Come on. Is the, his first come on. name. No, he's just called the squirrel. Oh, he's making a... He doesn't want me to get him. But he's on oh, top of him. his he's hammock. A bit, he's a bit camera shy. Come on. Come on. Just for a little bit. Come on. No. <laughs> <laughs> that noise <laughs> is leave me alone before I bite the shit out of your hand. But he's gone in because he was just lying on the outside watching me. But he's gone in now and he won't come out. Um, oh, what? Well, look, why don't Come you on, don't before we go. Why don't we talk a little bit about what's going on now, huh? What's going what's on? What's going on now? Right now? Um, well, I've got a, I've got a couple of tunes coming out soon. I've got a tune coming out with an Italian rapper, and um, nice. she's. It's kind of like a reggae tongue. Um, come on, yeah, it's kind of like a reggae tongue summertime crossover tune so that should be happening in the summer and i've got some i've got some like really exciting things coming up um it's rupture's 15th birthday yeah this year and so um i'm doing a few gigs with rupture as well because i'm kind of their resident kind of and yeah. Well, yeah, black, I've got eye, some... black eyes in there as well so... yeah yeah you're picking yeah. up our blacks and yeah. so, yeah, I've got some really exciting gigs coming up. I'm doing Tomorrowland with wow, Unorthodox. Nice. And, yeah, some really, really cool yeah. things happening. Each time I think that I've retired, something will happen where it's like, oh, go on yeah. then. And then it yeah. kind of ramps back up again and, you know. One but, more for the road. Right. And then yeah. it's, um, yeah, even Rennie asked if I would do a show with him, you know, so, and you know, he's, he's still... proper retired, hasn't he? Yeah. Uh, well, he's doing some amazing art stuff, actually. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you've seen it. Um, him and Jim uh, from Finger Licking. Uh, I think at one point they had a gallery together. Did they? Um, but yeah. Down at the, I went to, I went to his, he had a gallery down in Chiswick and I went to see him. God, it was a few years ago now. Um... But yeah, he's uh, he seems to be doing. I haven't spoken to him for ages. Actually, I'll give him a call. He's love Rennie. He was always a very uh, I loved his sense of humour. Super dry. Yeah, yeah he's yeah. very dry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and for those people listening that don't know, Rennie Pilgrim uh, was part of. Uh, well, probably most of you do know, but he's part of Rhythm Section along with uh, LSD, 
uh, Nick and God, I always remember the forget the fourth one. Oh, were there Nick. four? I thought there was three. Maybe there is three. No, it was Rennie, Nick, Roy. Roy. That's Come on, someone help me out. Someone help me out. There'll be a, there'll be someone there for the for the fourth one. Um, yeah, that's great. The rupture guys. So I've started to get to know Mantra and Dubs recently because their youngest is in my daughter's class. So they're both no from way. reception, little four year olds. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, uh, little river. Yeah, uh, soul. Uh, yeah. yeah uh, oh, no, soul. Yes. Oh, I see. Yes. Soul. Sorry, yes. they've got a younger yeah. one that's younger than him. They've got little yes, baby. That, oh, yes. Yeah, sorry, the soul's the middle one. Yeah. Yes. Um, but amazingly, in since September, I've only ever seen them once. So, like, I'm always there. Like, my kids love getting to school super early. Well, my son does. He like he wants to be first through the gate. Oh. And I think, and I think <laughs> Indy's like, kid, you know, she's like dragging him in there. And like she gets in there, like, you know, just one minute before the game's closing. So you, well, our <laughs> ship's never passed in the school. So I My kids would be punted in like a rugby ball from outside. <laughs> just Double drop. Oh, Where God, no. I, I just, I don't. That's one thing I don't regret. Um, kids, I do miss the fact that I don't have them. But at mm. the same time school runs the school gates the other parents the politics the teachers teaching another human to speak and not let it say any swear words i mean <laughs> just that alone you know don't skin yeah, up that... in front of it don't talk about anything like i just i'm auntie boo and i'm all right you... with that do you know what? You've pretty much got all the majors, <laughs> all the major no-nos down. So you're onto a good start. Yeah, yeah. I teach some really like naughty songs, right? <laughs> that you know where it's got like um, what do they call it? Like connotations behind it, like um, a sword, a sword, a soldier I will be. Two piss, two piss, two pistols on my knee. Fuck oh, you, yeah, okay. fuck you, for curiosity. I'll fight for my country. I'll fight for my country. I'll fight for my country. <laughs> Lyrics. Ba, 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 I, I was putting my daughter to bed last night. She goes, Daddy, uh, if you if I have all these fingers down and this one up, it means I'm bad. I said, oh yeah. Who uh, who told you that? She goes, Oh Dylan, her big brother was like, Oh yeah, all right, I'll have a chat with him after. Don't you worry. She's only four. Oh, oh Dylan. I mean, nice one, big brother, but oh, <laughs> If I do this, laugh, right? <laughs> I was desperately trying not to piss myself laughing. She just wanted to give you the finger, mate, and got yeah, away with it as yeah. well. I was like, yeah, actually, she just mugged me off, didn't she? <laughs> Dad, what's that? Like, uh, two weeks uh, grounding, that's what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. And this is only just the beginning, right? Certainly, oh god, a little girl as well. Oh, daddy, oh, yeah, she is a dad, proper daddy's girl as well. Yeah, I bet, yeah, yeah, I bet she's adorable. She is, she's super cute, so funny. Like, she literally properly makes me laugh out loud every single day with that fan. Oh, wow, she's got that's like so the facial, the comedy face, and the things she says. So, yeah, she uh, she keeps me entertained. It's like, especially when you had yeah, like a real, you know, crap couple of hours or whatever, and you go in, she just says something stupid, you're like, yeah, okay. I could forget all that bullshit now. Oh, mate, that's really nice. Your face lights up when you talk about your kids as well. Oh, nice, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, anyway, yeah, back to cool jungle uh, yeah, business. Yeah, motherfucking, yeah, yeah. motherfucking, motherfucking. Jungle, motherfucker. jungle, brother. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really excited for uh, the event that we're going to play out. Um, uh, and I hope we're going to cross paths even more. You know, maybe Breakbeat's yeah. going to come back again. I know that, you know, people keep trying to wheel it out again. I get wheeled out in... Uh, in Spain, like once or twice a year. Like, oh, yeah. I've got something in Spain, actually, a breakbeat gig in Spain. I think I'm working with Crafty Cuts and the the name of the party, because, you know, Spain, they're a bit backwards sometimes with the progressive things. And the party is men versus man versus woman. And um, it's me versus Crafty Cuts. So I'm like... How could you have a DJ go again versus an MC? Aren't I just going to get on the mic and be like, you're a prick, sucky mum? And then I've won because he's going to be too vexed to come back from that. He's not going to come back from that, is he? It's crafty <laughs> cuts. He's a prick. Like, he's going to. You can't versus men and women like that. 
And yeah, like, yeah, who are the it. other women at the party that there are enough women to go against the men do, in a do you battle? Think they meant to, do you think they meant to say back to back and not versus? I maybe. I hope so. I really yeah. hope so. But that I don't know. It kind it's of weird. reminds me of uh, that DJ in Russia. Uh, he was a resident uh, in Beats We Trust, and he was called DJ Fascist. And I was like, No way. I was like, do you know what that means? He went, ha, 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 yes. There we <laughs> oh, are. There he is. So let's get, let's get you full screen. There we go. Come on. Hey. There Come we on, are. Squirrel. This is your TV debut. This is it, mate. I hope you brushed your teeth. Make me, fam- make me famous. Is is he like kind of fully, is he fully grown? Nearly, yeah. He's sort of adolescent now. But yeah, he's he's getting there. Come here. No. He's run. That's the thing about squirrels is they're very, very rarely still. Mm. They're always moving around and stuff. But yeah, he's jumped. He on didn't his find cage. that. He hasn't found a bowl of speed, has he? I tell you what, mate. That's exactly what it's like. <laughs> it's like he's hoofed up the most jangliest, awfulest <laughs> caffeine cut crap all the time. He's just like wired all the time, like like that, and like they twitch and move really quick so just trying to take a photo of him is impossible oh he's gone in his hammock in his cage now he's really yeah, he's, done. <laughs> he's done his he's done his he's done his three minutes of fame he's well done. he appeared yeah he appeared what more can well, i good say we got to see him oh, there was definitely uh yeah there's definitely some appreciation on the comments that's nice <laughs> yay squirrel star of the show <laughs> yeah after all that i might as well have just brought you out for 10 minutes and then just yeah. that's it like, that's all squirrel. people want to see. I just get requests yeah. online as well, like show us your squirrel. I was yeah. at a gig the other I week mean, on sure. New Year's Eve and people were asking about the squirrel. I don't know who they are, but they seem to know about the squirrel. So, yeah, there he's famous. Yeah. That's it. Get, start getting yeah. behind the decks. On Thank the you so much for um, asking me to come on this interview. Like, I really appreciate that. And I've known you for so long. It's yeah. nice to, like, catch up with you anyway whenever i do see you but we very rarely get to like sit and have a chat and stuff so thank yeah, you very much sure. no listen yeah. it's been an absolute honor to chat to you i'm uh you know i'm always uh in awe of people right like yourself that have just you know managed to m- maintain such an amazing career and, and be and be still be relevant right and and talking to you today i don't think we've really had this kind of in-depth conversation about kind of you and music and to hear your kind of passion and and actually just very well balanced just straightforward view at music and life um i can see how 30 years later you know you're still getting booked you're still being asked and you're still doing a great job so well done oh thank, thanks thanks <laughs> oh, yeah. oh don't a bit hormonal i'll have a moment in <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. No, listen, thank you very much for coming on. We are going to catch up for sure and do, and I'm going to let everyone know where we're playing because it's going to be, um, oh, I won't say. It's I'm in London, in isn't it? It's going to be London, yeah, in April. Yeah, mid, yes. middle April. Um, so I'll keep everyone posted uh, and we'll cause some serious damage there. For oh, sure. that's going to be great. Yeah, it would be really nice to see you. And is there anything else I haven't answered or I just, do you know what? I didn't actually. Oh, I, I was re. I completely forgot. I was so engrossed in our conversation. Um, is there any questions that anyone wanted to ask Chickaboo before we let her go? I'm going to try and scour through the comments. Uh, what have we got? Here we go. Apart from get your squirrel out, obviously. <laughs> there was a few, can you? <laughs> I, honestly, my mind went straight to the really dirty version of that as soon as I heard it. I was I like, think that's it ferret, red? isn't it? Get your ferret out. Is it out. also red as well? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me uh, show you. Like, can you imagine? <laughs> show us a squirrel. Um, not a question. Uh, my first rave was Vibeli at Venue 44. Oh my God. I first saw G Real and Chickaboo. Loved you both. Uh, I absolutely loved Shapeshifter, but I only learned a few weeks back uh, you, you did the vocals on that track. Oh, right. Yeah. For representing in the scene in a heavily dominated male environment. And that's for Della oh. Benz. Easy, Della Benz. You know what? I, um, I looked at a Vibeli flyer just the other day because i had an interview i had to show some flyers so i found 
you know, um, like Elevation 92 and 93 and Dreamscapes and Fantasias. And the Viber Light Flyer was there and it was like Carl Cox, G Real, like proper big names. Yeah. It was like eight pounds till six in the morning from 10 o'clock till six in the morning. It's like eight quid of Carl Cox and all of us. Like the price of these parties, Elevation was 10 pounds. Yeah, I went to most of those as well. I was on the yeah. flyer on one of them. I think Thankfully, I might have they... that flyer. It's the 93 yeah. one. It's the big sort of poster one. I yeah. have that. I'm, I'm glad they didn't get my face in it because that would have not have been pretty. I'm pretty sure it's snowballs oh. were going around at the time and they oh. were they were, <laughs> they, oh, they were not kind. <laughs> they were spangly, yeah. weren't they? Yeah. I loved them, in all honesty. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's been a earth... long time, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, what on earth says, does Chickaboo have any other creative outlets, perhaps poetry or writing? Everyone has a novel in them. Um, that's interesting. I like um, playing bass guitar. Nice. And um, I've just got a need to sort of like doodling with a bit more depth to it. I've started doing that more. And plants. I like plants. I like growing things. Nice. Quite a gardener. And... Uh, Decorate, you know, I used to be a decorator many years ago and um, I I just sort of renovated that. my house as well. Yeah, I saw so you. I, I learned following plastering. Your, doing and, that. Yeah, I learned plastering and did that and uh, renovated my house. So that's an ongoing project. But yeah, I like doing things with my hands. I like cooking and stuff and all of that good housewife mm. stuff. Nice. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Honestly, stuff, I love right? folding a bit of clothing, doing a bit of iron. Yeah. Like, I love it. I love all that. But I. I, I haven't ironed for ages because I never. I only used to iron when I used to wear shirts. Other, everything else just goes on and it'll eventually flatten itself, right? You but with see, shirts, you say that, but it doesn't, mate. I just, I just hide it. Do you know what? I just, <laughs> I've worn such <laughs> trampy clothes over the last two years. It's unbelievable. I've, wore, I've actually worn some tracksuit bottoms down that I've had to throw them away. Yeah, I've been okay. really bad. Yeah. I mean, there's no judgments here, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lies. Lies. Um, here we go. All right, we got a question from uh, Chris Winter. Says, which DJ did you like to MC with? Um, different DJs for different reasons. G Real because he was such a hard task master, master that any sort of success just felt amazing. You know, if you please somebody that's hardly ever pleased. It's such an achievement. So there was that. And the things we did together as well was just so groundbreaking, you know. It felt groundbreaking for me in my life. And looking back on it, I've never had those experiences since. You know, you can't repeat the first. Yeah. Um, Daisy for America and taking a style of music that they hadn't really heard in a lot of the towns that we went to. Um Yourself, actually, at um, that TCR barbecue once when you were like double dropping anthems in and out. Like, I remember that set and there's so many sets, of course, in my career. But for me to just remember any is like quite an achievement for my brain. I'm but I remember a... that set with you that was just mad. I'm going to send you uh, uh, a video clip. It's really obviously because back then phones would just start or I think it was still cameras. You weren't really be able to record stuff with phones, but I've got a really crappy video clip and I just I love it so much. I'm actually getting goosebumps now because that place is really small. Yeah. And you could just see it was all our mates. There was Scotty and King Youth and Inchi and like everyone was there. And I just I can't remember. It was the nine into a uh, chase the status tune and the whole place just everyone just started pushing it each other and like it was like a proper little mosh bit um, yeah. i'll send it to you because you're in the middle yeah. of it as well it's amazing <laughs> i'm gonna dig that out you yeah. me of that. i remember i remember our set and um you know like lady wax in russia and you know going to australia with jazzy b for example and the crowd there like people just freaking out and going mad and i'm like saying like ladies and gentlemen karen wheeler things that you know I've introduced us at the O2, you know, wow. like walking out on stage at the O2. Honestly, my hands were shaking. I had to hold okay. the mic with both hands because I was shaking so much. Um, so I had many different, you know, reasons for celebrating different DJs. Yeah. So it's really hard to pin it down to just one. 
you know. But it's nice, right? There's you. There's there's different DJs for different ones. I like that. You know, it's it's it shows the diversity of what you've done. Uh, and yeah. I'm very much looking forward to you know what's still yet uh, to come. We have got uh, Cliff Harper says favorite rave uh, or venue or pro venue or rave. Oh, the Sanctuary in Milton Keynes was pretty good, wasn't it? I mean, really, there's that. Um, Glastonbury as well, just for the sheer magnitude of the ridiculousness of it. Like, while you're watching an act, there's 27 other acts that you really want to see at the same time. So yeah. you're constantly just running around, but there's nothing like it in the world. There's nothing like Glastonbury, you know? Yeah. So it's a real experience to be on site. Even if I'm not working there, just to be there on site is just a real, you know, good experience, I think, for anybody um, to have that. Um, oh, what was that? Blue Note on a Sunday? Yeah, Metalhead. there you go. I that never went to that. I'm really glad to... That was Definitely. a real vibe. Low ceilings, you know, Cleveland, what kiss on the mic, Randall on the decks. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Mind you, what was oh. that? Not Laser Drone, was it? That was a good one. Peckham, yeah. Yeah, that was a good one. Um, I used to come out of there with black eyes because, you know, you it was that big kind of, uh, it was a laser skirmish thing, obviously, but the big open space that had like seats and stuff in it. But then when you went into like room one, it was all just mental black and lasers. And it was like, you know, kind of little, like you'd bump into people with them walls, their mirrors. And like, you know, you'd come out of there like you'd just done a few rounds with Tyson. It was. Uh, yeah, I lethal. think I spoke to myself for about 45 minutes once. <laughs> You know them ones. Full Best on as well. Ever. Where are you from? What you had? <laughs> Me so, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I think I've met my soulmate. <laughs> <laughs> Give us your number. Uh, that's the same uh, as my number. Yeah, like, oh yes. my God, did my name's with the one as well. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, there's bless. many, many different things, you know, like they're all really quite special to me, whether I remember them or I don't. There's some part of my subconscious that does remember them and I do hold them very dear and they're very precious to me, those memories. I am, I'm gonna ask you one final question. Okay. What was the inspiration behind MC Chickaboo as a name? <laughs> um, my sister had a doll called a Chickaboo and you squeezed its shoulders kind of thing and it opened its arms and you could like attach it to things. They were called cheekaboos. They were sort of like quite big in the eighties. And um, yeah, I was trying, just trying to find a name and stuff. And I sat with my mum and my sister like, oh, MC fireplace or oh, MC chair, <laughs> MC, you know, cause I was getting MC kicks, but I didn't have an MC name. Right, yeah. And so um, my mum, I think went MC cheekaboo and I was like, oh. So I changed it from Chica because that's a bit too, like, um, playful. So I changed yeah. it to Chica, which made sure that no men would take that name. And um, so it was Chica Boo. Nice. And then I like, broke it go. down a bit more and Chica is girl. And Boo is to get, like, you scare someone or get their attention. So it kind nice. of worked out on that level. I like him. Well, you yeah. say you laugh about the MC fireplace. That that mentality was exactly how terry hooligan and i came up with the name for menu music the record label really we were sitting in a fish and chip shop uh in queen's park trying to work out this concept this label and what we're going to do and terry just went i don't know we should just call it something i don't know just like menu and just pulled up the menu and i was like that's so simply genius let's just do that and that was it that's where it came from menu music best ideas <laughs> but that gave you because you picked that name it gave you um an opportunity to have a wider scale of what you were putting out because it's yeah. called menu so you can put all kinds of things on a menu right rather than just specifically if you called it like you know breakbeat dreams or whatever yeah then, yeah you know but menu music you can always bring that back at any time and put anything out on it you know Hint, hint. No. Oh, 
<laughs> are you over the label running thing? I do you know I I love the excitement of championing uh, new artists, and we did this with both menu and with the label I had on my own sub slayers. I was I was always about finding younger talent, bringing them up, helping them out, fine tuning their craft, and then putting them onto other labels. You know, I did it with sub slayers and Toronto's broken. I ended up getting them a deal with Viper Recordings. Schema went on to do stuff with Ram Records. King Youth went on with Chopstick Dubplate, and that's that's my reward. Like I love that. That's like, you know, I'd never did, you know. I never did contracts, which I actually should have done, but I didn't do contracts. I didn't want them to be tied to the label. I was like, listen, you know, this is how it works. If you want to go off, if the time's right for you to progress yeah. and do something else, I'm here right behind you. Like, I'll, I'll support yeah. you. But that's, that's, that's not good business, but it's very ethical of you. But it's not business, yeah. what we yeah. know in this industry to be what it is. You yeah. Know? Yeah, but I should probably, that's honourable of you. It's honourable, yeah. you know, but yeah. honour doesn't make a millionaire, does it? It doesn't, but you know the label labels have always been for me just like a passion thing. I've never, I've always, ha I've always had a full time job throughout everything I've done. So I've never looked at music as something that I've got to, you know, this needs right. to pay the bills. Right. Um, I'd had a couple of opportunities, but not really. Um, so it was always, I got that's what I got my buzz from was finding this new music, playing it on radio, bringing the artists up, you know, and just and 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 giving like a leg up to what it's you know help grow a scene right you know it's it's great to have all these people at the top that are championing and that are playing room one in fabric every time but the scene's going to go nowhere if you're not bringing new people into it absolutely you know, younger people to to grow it you know mm -hmm. um so it was all it was always about that really and you know yeah. i think with both menu and sub slayers so i feel like i'm being interviewed now yeah uh, i think i'm interviewing <laughs> myself in all honesty <laughs> No, um, I would so, quite like to see an interview with you. I don't think that's the worst idea in the world, you know. It's an all um, right thing. Roy uh, LSD did say to me, he said, I, I want to, I said to him, oh, we should do like a part two. He's like, no, I want to interview you. Yeah, like, it's no, a great idea. Yeah, Especially him doing it as well, you know, because he yeah. was there with so many of the things, you know. He yeah. went before a lot of us, you know, so that I would be very interested to see that. Yeah, yeah sounds good. It's easier than writing a book, isn't it? <laughs> Well, really, I bet he's forgotten more than I know. Oh God, yeah, he right. He, he was actually quite funny, right? Because we were re in in about three bits of the interview, we were really scrambling around, and I was pre-recording these at the time, and we were really scrambling around with trying to stuff. And the amount of messages I got going, yeah, I've always said it was this, but actually it wasn't. It was that. And actually, the the venue you guys were thinking about was this, and we're like, oh, thank God, a pair of us, you know, like a pair of our geriatrics trying to remember our daughter's name. <laughs> nice. <sighs> yeah, bless you. Anyway, listen, um, a pleasure and honor. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank um, you. I'm going to stick this up on the podcast. So for anyone that missed the beginning or uh, wants to listen to it again, uh, it will be up on Spotify and Apple Music and all that jazz uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, I right, wish you every continued success. And I, if I don't speak to you before April, I will definitely see you. At the venue. Definitely, darling. And thank you so much for, uh, you know, having me on your show. It's a real honour. Thank you. My pleasure, darling. Thank you. We'll Lots of love, you. everyone. All right. We got the ravers.